Adam's Curse by William Butler Yeats, read for LibriVox.org by Cuspinaisen. We sat together at one summer's end, that beautiful mild woman, your close friend, and you and I, and talked of poetry. I said, a line will take us hours, maybe, yet if it does not seem a moment thought, our stitching and unstitching has been naught. Better go down upon your marrow bones and scrub a kitchen pavement, or break stones like an old pauper in all kinds of weather. For to articulate sweet sounds together is to work harder than all these, and yet be thought an idler by the noisy set of bankers, schoolmasters, and clergymen the martyrs call the world. And there upon that beautiful mild woman, for whose sake there's many a one shall find out all heartache, on finding that her voice is sweet and low, replied, To be born woman is to know, although they do not talk of it at school, that we must labor to be beautiful. I said, It's certain there is no fine thing since Adam's fall, but needs much laboring. There have been lovers who thought love should be so much compounded of high courtesy that they would sigh and quote with learned looks, precedents out of beautiful old books. Yet now it seems an idle trade enough. We sat grown quiet at the name of love. We saw the last embers of daylight die, and in the trembling blue-green of the sky a moon, worn as if it had been a shell, washed by time's waters as they rose and fell about the stars, and broke in days and years. I had a thought for no one's but your ears, that you were beautiful, and that I strove to love you in the old high way of love, that it had all seemed happy, and yet we'd grown as weary-hearted as that hollow moon. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ballad of the Book Hunter by Andrew Lang, read for LibriVox by David Wales. Ballad of the Book Hunter. In torrid heats of late July, in March beneath the bitter bees, he book hunts while the loungers fly. He book hunts though December freeze, in breeches baggy at the knees and heedless of the public jeers. For these, for these he hoards his fees. Aldine's Bodenese Elzevirs. No dismal stall escapes his eye, he turns o'er tomes of low degrees, there soiled romanticists may lie, or restoration comedies. Each tract that flutters in the breeze, for him is charged with hopes and fears, in mouldy novels fancy sees Aldine's Bodenese. Elzevirs. With restless eyes that peer and spy, sad eyes that heed not skies nor trees, in dismal nooks he loves to pry, whose motto evermore is spies. But ah, the fabled treasure flees, grown rarer with the fleeting years, in rich men's shelves they take their ease, Aldine's Bodenese Elzevirs. Envoy. Prince, all the things that tease and please, fame, hope, wealth, kisses, cheers, and tears, what are they but such toys as these, Aldine's, Bodenese, Elzevirs? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Bee by Sidney Lanier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. The Bee. What time I paced at pleasant morn, a deep and dewy wood, I heard a mellow hunting horn make dim report of Diane's lusty hood. Far down a heavenly hollow, mine ear, though fain, had pain to follow. Terra! it twanged tara tara it blew yet wavered oft and flew most fickle wise about or here or there a music now from earth and now from air but on a sudden lo i marked a blossom shiver to and fro with dainty inward storm 
and there, within, a down-drawn trump of yellow jessamine, a bee thrust up its sad gold body lustily, all in a honey madness hotly bound, on blissful burglary a cunning sound, in that wing music held me, down I lay, in amber shades of many a golden spray, where looping low with languid arms the vine in wreaths of ravishment did overtwine her kneeling live oak thousandfold to plight herself unto her own true stalwart knight as some dim blur of distant music nears the long-desired sense and slowly clears to forms of time an apprehensive tune so as i lay full soon interpretation throve the bee's fanfare through sequent films of discourse vague as air passed to plain words while fanning faint perfume the bee o'erhung a rich unrifled bloom o earth fair lordly blossom soft a shine upon the star pranked universal vine has not for me to thee come i a poet hereward haply blown from out another world flower lately flown wilt ask what profit e'er a poet brings he beareth starry stuff about his wings to pollen thee and sting thee fertile nay if still thou narrow thy contracted way world flower if thou refuse me world flower if thou abuse me and hoist thy stamens spear point high to wound my wing and mar mine eye nathless i'll drive me to thy deepest sweet yea richlier shall that pain the pollen beat from me to thee for oft these pollens be fine dust from wars that poets wage for thee but o oh, beloved earth bloom soft to shine upon the universal jessamine prithee abuse me not prithee refuse me not yield yield the heartsome honey love to me hid in thy nectary and as i sank into a dimmer dream the pleading bees song burthen soul did seem hast ne'er a honey drop of love for me in thy huge nectary end of poem this recording is in the public domain by the sea by emily dickinson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain Reading by Matt Perard. By the Sea I started early, took my dog, and visited the sea. The mermaids in the basement came out to look at me, and frigates in the upper floor extended hempen hands, presuming me to be a mouse, aground upon the sands. But no man moved me till the tide went past my simple shoe and past my apron and my belt and past my bodice too and made as he would eat me up as holy as dew upon a dandelion sleeve and then i started too and he he followed close behind i felt his silver heel upon my ankle then my shoes would overflow with pearl until we met the solid town no man he seemed to know and bowing with a mighty look at me the sea withdrew end of poem this recording is in the public domain charles the twelfth of sweden rides in the ukraine by reina maria rilke Translated from the German by Jesse Lamont. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp.
Kings in old legends seem like mountains rising in the evening light. They blind all with their gleam. Their loins encircled are by girdles bright. Their robes are edged with bands of precious stones, the rarest earth affords. With richly jeweled hands they hold their slender, shining, naked swords. A young king from the north did fare, defeated in the Ukraine. He hated springtime and women's hair and the sound of the harp's refrain. Upon a steel-gray horse he rode, and like steel was his gray eyes glance. Never for woman had they glowed, and to none had he lowered his lance. Never a woman his colors claimed, and none to kiss him would dare, for at times, when his quick wrath flamed, a moon of pearls he would tear from a coil of wondrous hair, when seized by melancholy mood he wreaked his will of a maid as he would, and the bridegroom, whose ring she wore, pursued through the glade and across the heath with a hundred hounds for many a rood, till he hunted him to his death. He left his gray land dim and far, whose voice to him never spake, and rode out under the thrall of war, and fought for danger's sake. Now he seemed under a spell to ride, dreamily slipping his steel-gloved hand over his armor from band to band, but found no sword at his side. And then a miracle occurred, a glorious vision of battle stirred and fired his kindling pride. He sat on his horse and glanced around, no movement escaped him, and no sound. Steel unto steel and silver spoke. Voices were now in everything. Like many bells they seemed to ring as the soul of each thing awoke. The wind, too, stealthily onward crept, and suddenly into the flags it sprang, lean like a panther, breathless leapt. Reeling as blasts from the trumpets rang, it wrestled and laughed and sang. Then again it would softly hum, as by some bleeding boy it would dart, beating a rally upon his drum carried with uplifted head into the grave, born like his heart before his battalions dead. Many a mountain upward reared, as though the earth not yet old had grown, but in the making still appeared, and now the iron stood still as stone, and then like a forest at evening swayed, and ever the rising shape still neared the army's mightily moving shade. The dust rose up like vapors veiled, darkness not of time enveloped all, and everything grew gray and paled, and smoke rose up and fell like a pall. Again flame broadened and grew bright, and all was festively in light. They attacked. The exotic colors reeled. On swarms of fantastic provinces rode. All iron with laughter suddenly pealed. From a prince in luminous silver flowed the gleam of the evening battlefield. Like fluttering joys, flags seemed to thrill. Each gesture now showed the desire to regally waste, to wantonly spill. The flames leapt on far buildings till the stars themselves caught fire. Night came, and the battle's surging range receded like a tired sea that brought with it many dead and strange. And all the dead lay there heavily. The gray horse cautiously picked its way past great fists, starkly warning it back, in a foreign land the dead men lay where it stepped over grass that was matted and black. And he who upon the gray horse sat, looked down on the colors moist and frayed, saw silver like shivered glass ground flat, saw iron wither and helmets drink, and swords stand stiff in the armor's chink, saw dying hands waving tattered brocade, and saw them not. After the tumult of battle he rode onward, as though in a trance, alone, and as with passion his warm cheeks glowed, like those of a lover his gray eyes shone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Child of Mercy by Johann Gottfried von Herder. 1744 to 1803. Read for LibriVox.org. When the Almighty would create mankind, he called his chief angels to counsel around him. Create him not, said the angel of justice. He will be unjust toward his brethren, and with those that are weak will he deal harshly and cruelly. Create him not, said the angel of peace. He will drench the earth with human blood and the firstborn of his race will become a fratricide. 
he will profane thy holiness with falsehood exclaimed the angel of truth even though thou shouldest enstamp thine own image the seal of truth upon his forehead while they were yet speaking mercy the youngest the dearest child of the eternal father approached his throne and clasped his knees create him cried she create him father an image of thyself a cherished object of thy goodness when all thy servants have forsaken him then will i seek him and will stand fondly by him and will turn even his faults to good his frail heart will i fill with compassion and will incline it to commiserate the weaker when he wanders from peace and truth when he offends against justice and equity then shall even the consequence of his error lead him back chastened and improved the father of the human race created man a frail and erring creature but even in his faults a favorite of his goodness a son of mercy a son of that love which can never forsake him but which ever seeks to make him better remember thy origin o man when thou art cruel and unjust of all the divine attributes mercy alone chose to call thee into being and hath through life extended to thee only the love and compassion of the maternal breast end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Dying Indian by Philip Fernot. Read for LibriVox.org by Jen Hoffman. On yonder lake I spread the sail no more. Vigor and youth and active days are past. Relentless demons urge me to that shore, on whose black forests all the dead are cast. Ye solemn train, prepare the funeral song. For I must go to shades below, Where all is strange and all is new, Companion to the airy throng. What solitary streams in dull and dreary dreams, All melancholy, must I rove along? To what strange lands must Shalom take his way? Groves of the dead departed mortals trace, no deer along those gloomy forests stray no huntsmen there take pleasure in the chase but all are empty unsubstantial shades that ramble through those visionary glades no spongy fruits from verdant trees depend but sickly orchards there do fruits as sickly bear and apples a consumptive visage shew and withered hangs the whortleberry blue. Ah me, what mischiefs on the dead attend, Wandering a stranger to the shores below! Where shall I brook or real fountain find? Lazy and sad deluding waters flow. Such is the picture in my boding mind. Fine tales indeed, they tell of shades and purling rills, where our dead fathers dwell, beyond the western hills. But when did ghost return his state to shew? Or who can promise half the tale is true? I too must be a fleeting ghost, no more. None, none but shadows to those mansions go. I leave my woods, I leave the hood on shore, for emptier groves below. Ye charming solitudes, ye tall ascending woods, ye glassy lakes and prattling streams, whose aspect still was sweet, whether the sun did greet, or the pale moon embraced you with her beams, adieu to all, to all that charmed me where I strayed, the winding stream, the dark sequestered shade, adieu all triumphs here, Adieu, the mountain's lofty swell. Adieu, thou little verdant hill. And seas, and stars, and skies. Farewell, for some remoter sphere. 
perplexed with doubts and tortured with despair. Why so dejected at this hopeless sleep? Nature at last these ruins may repair, when fate's long dream is o'er and she forgets to weep. Some real world once more may be assigned, some new-born mansion for the mortal mind. Farewell, sweet lake, farewell surrounding woods, to other groves, through midnight glooms I stray, beyond the mountains, and beyond the floods, beyond the Huron Bay. Prepare the hollow tomb, and place me low, my trusty bow and arrows by my side, the cheerful bottle, and the vents in store. For long the journey is that I must go, without a partner, and without a guide. He spoke, and bid the attending mourners weep, then closed his eyes, and sunk to endless sleep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Glorious Twelfth at Jindabai by Victor Daly Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles Came a horseman to O'Brien's, and his voice was stern and high. Mick, the orange men are mustering by scores at Jindabai, and unless the boys are gathered quick, twill be a woeful sight, for there'll be a big procession, and there won't be any fight. Mick O'Brien heard the summons as he stood beside his gate. He was six foot two in stockings, sixteen stone his fighting weight. Pat O'Connor, he said softly, take a drink before you go, and then ride and rouse the Callahans. We'll all be at the show. Saddle up, he cried to Barney, saddle up the black and bay, saddle up the white and roan as well, we'll have the devil's day. Missus, missus, tear your sheets up fast as ever tear yous can. We'll want bandages this evening, or I'm not a monster man. Then he called unto his stalwart sons, Get up, get up, cried he. Now I wonder, said Cornelius, what the old man's game can be. But the old man's voice in thunder rose, Remember boys Athlone, and remember Boyne and Orkram, and the broken treaty stone. Then Cornelius said to Dennis, What in thunder does he mean? We have heard of Boyne and Orkram, we have heard of Skibbereen, and we know that dear old island of the ocean is the gem, but why, why should we go breaking heads because of it or them? But their mother spake right scornfully, and ye are sons of mine. On this day me uncle Dan O'Toole would make his blackthorn shine. He would make it shine and quiver at the mention of that river, and the beating Billy gave us at the Battle of the Bine. Och, the green flag floated bravely, the black orange men to spite, and there hardly was a house without its broken head that night, and me brother and your father, boys, he'll tell you this is true, came home stiff with blood and glory, as good Irishmen should do. Holy Patrick, are ye traitors? Rise up quickly, Con and Din. We were only lonely women, but we had the hearts of men. In old Ireland, when the twelfth came round, O oh, Fay, t'was our delight, for to bandage up the wounded when they tottered home at night. Then they rose and put their garments on, did Con and Din and Mick, while young Patrick to the kitchen went to choose himself a stick. Hush, he whispered to his sister, who was weeping in the yard, I shall have to stoush Bill Naaman, but I will not stoush him hard. Now Bill Lehman and fair Nan O'Bee were sweethearts on the sly, and they took no sort of interest in the memories of July. They were native-born Australians, and had vowed their hands to join, and they didn't care a hairpin for the Battle of the Boyne. Barney saddled up like lightning, saddled up the blackened bay, saddled up the white and roan as well, and oh, but he was gay, for this old and trusty vassal of the bold O'Brien clan, as the devil holy water loves, did love an orange man. 
they aroused the Red McCormicks and the Firths of Dooley Buck, and the Fagans and the Hagans and the Quins of Damn the Luck, and these heroes swiftly sprang to horse, without a word to say, for they knew that fun was brewing when O'Brien led the way. Mick O'Brien and Dad Hogan proudly led the cavalcade, and they looked like brigand captains, riding forth upon a raid, and for joy of coming ructions like a backblock's talifer, Big McCormick threw his stick aloft and caught it in the air. At the township's end they saw a sight right maddening to behold, all the orange men in trappings fine of purple and of gold. There were Lineses and Laymans there and Nugents and McCalls, and they marched along so boldly to the tune of Derry Walls. Briggs the sword and Bible carried, Briggs was always to the fore, sobered up for the occasion, Boozer Scott the banner bore, and old Schnorenberg the Dutchman made the trumpet hoot and hum, while fat Henderson the butcher pounded wildly on the drum. Mick O'Brien at the circus gazed, and his ire commenced to rise, and the lurid light of war began to kindle in his eyes. Old Dad Hogan, leaning over, whispered hoarse behind his hand, Be me soul now, Mick O'Brien, this is more than I can stand. But in spite of all, the day might still have ended up in peace, without broken heads or instruments, or work for the police, if it hadn't been for Doolan's educated cockatoo, that had been for months in training for the Orangeman's chevau. On the roof of Doolan's pub it perched and talked in language vile, and to hell with old King Billy, screeched in most insulting style. Ring its blanky neck, cried someone, it's a papist through and through, and a rush was made immediately for Doolan's cockatoo. Then O'Brien to Dad Hogan said, The time to charge has come, I'll lay out the banner-bearer while you batter in the drum, and the forces of O'Brien that to fight were never slow, with a whoop, remember Limerick, rushed fiercely on the foe. But the foe had seen them coming, and his horsemen sat in rank, waiting sternly to go through them with a countercharge in flank. Then the fight became Homeric, and the champions of each clan came against each other bravely, horse to horse and man to man. Bull-necked Ballantyne the blacksmith, with a visage fierce and grim, yelled around for Big McCormick. Big McCormick yelled for him. When they met the bold McCormick with a poltog mighty fine, made a subject for a stretcher of the valiant Ballantyne. Seeing this then, Harry Hamilton let out a howl for blood, and he charged upon Tim Fagan, and Tim Fagan bit the mud. Better far for Tim had he been grubbing stumps, in quiet way, on his farm at Dead Cat Gully, than in Jindabai that day. Sandy Armstrong sorely battered, in his saddle rocked and reeled, but he whirled his stick and scattered cock-eyed Hogan on the field. Cock-eyed Hogan was the proudest of the haughty Hogan race, and they carried him to Doolan's pub to straighten out his face. But the battle cries rose wildly, and the fight raged fierce and hot, like the fight o'er dead Patroclus o the form of Boozer Scott. Mick O'Brien, as he said he would, had laid him out all right, but the Boozer to his banner clung, and kicked with all his might. Boys, they mustn't seize our banner man, the biggest layman cried, and he sprang to ground with flaming eyes, the Boozer to bestride. But the Boozer swore that both sides he would prosecute by law, for Bill Lehman hauled him by the leg, and Brady by the jaw. And the battle for the Boozer might have lasted through July, if the boys on either side had not got synchronously dry. Big McCormick looked at Hamilton, and whispered with a wink, If you've had enough of bloodshed, Bill, we'll go and have a drink. When the fight was o'er the battlefield, a man might proudly scan, who was Irish, whether papist, fierce, or furious orange man, for there wasn't in the township any person to be seen who had not some little keepsake scar from orange side or green. In the gutter old Dad Hogan lay and feebly yelled for rum, while Fat Henderson sat weeping o'er the ruins of his drum. But O'Brien into Doolan stepped with eyes that proudly shone, and a lump upon his forehead you could hang your hat upon. 
Oh, the night they had at Doolan's, sure its like was never seen, for the lineses and laymans roared the wearin' of the green, and the Finns and Quins and Fagans sang Boyne Water without check, and they called each other brother and fell on each other's neck. Now the moral of this yarn is, if to Jindabar you go, never aggravate a lion's, or you'll make a quin a foe. Never strike at an O'Brien in your very angriest spasm, or a layman will reduce you to organic protoplasm. There are bonds of blood and marriage now, these ancient foes between, and the orange is inextricably mingled with the green, and that this broad kindly feeling should increase in coming time is the wish for green and orange of the writer of this rhyme. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. God Made This Day For Me by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Little T Just the sort of weather and just the sort of sky which seemed to suit my fancy with the white clouds drifting by on a sea of smooth blue water. Oh, I ain't an egotist with an eye and all my thinking, but I'm willing to insist that the Lord that made us humans and the birds in every tree knows my special sort of weather, and he made this day for me. This is just my sort of weather, sunshine flooding all the place, and the breezes from the eastward blowing gently on my face, and the woods chuck full of singing, do you think birds never had a single care to fret them, or a grief to make them sad? Oh, I settled down contented in the shadow of a tree, and tell myself quite proudly that the day was made for me. It's my day, sky and sunshine, and the tempter of the breeze. Here's the weather I would fashion, could I want things as I please. Beauty dancing all around me, music ringing everywhere, like a wedding celebration. Why, I plumb forgot my care, and the task I should be doing for the rainy days to be, while I'm hugging the delusion that God made this day for me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Little Hand by Francis Sargent Locke Osgood, read for LibriVox.org by Andrea Coffey. The Little Hand. We wandered sadly round the room. We missed the voices play that warbled through our hours of gloom and charmed the cloud away. We missed the footstep, love, and light, the tiny twining hand, the quick arch smile so wildly bright, the brow with beauty bland. We wandered sadly round the room, no relic could we find, no toy of hers to soothe our gloom, she left not one behind. But look, there is a misty trace, faint, undefined, and broken, of fingers on the mirror's face, a dear, though simple token, a cherub hand, the child we loved, had left its impress there, when first, by young ambition moved, she climbed the easy chair. She saw her own sweet self and tried to touch what seemed to be so near, so beautiful, and cried, Why, there's another me! Dear hand, though from the mirror's face thy form did seem to part, I wore its welcome, tender trace, long after in my heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love Song by Rainer Maria Rilke Translated by Jesse Lamont Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp When my soul touches yours, a great chord sings how shall I tune it then to other things? Oh, that some spot in darkness could be found That does not vibrate whene'er your depths sound. But everything that touches you and me Welds us as played strings sound one melody. 
Where is the instrument whence the sounds flow? And who's the master hand that holds the bow? Oh, sweet song! End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. People at Night by Rainer Maria Rilke Translated by Margarita Munsterberg Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp The nights were not made for crowds, and they sever you from your neighbor, and you shall never seek him defiantly at night. But if you make your dark house light to look on strangers in your room, you must reflect on whom. False lights that on men's faces play distort them gruesomely. You look upon a disarray, a world that seems to reel and sway, a waving, glittering sea. On foreheads gleams a yellow shine where thoughts are chased away, their glances flicker, mad from wine, and to the words they say strange heavy gestures make reply that struggle in the buzzing room. And they say always, I and I, and mean, they know not whom. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Phoenix and the Turtle by William Shakespeare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Let the bird of loudest lay on the sole Arabian tree, herald sad, and trumpet be to whose sound chaste wings obey. But thou, shrieking harbinger, foul precurrer of the fiend, augur of the fever's end, to this troop come thou not near. From this session interdict every fowl of tyrant wing, save the eagle, feathered king. Keep the obsequy so, strict. Let the priest in surplice white, that defunctive music can, be the death-divining swan, lest the requiem lack his right. And thou... Treble-dated crow, that thy sable gender makest with the breath thou givest and takest, mongst our mourners shalt thou go. Here the anthem doth commence. Love and constancy is dead. Phoenix and the turtle fled in a mutual flame from hence. So they loved. As love in twain had the essence but in one, Two distincts, division none, Number there in love was slain, Hearts remote, yet not asunder, Distance, and no space was seen Twixt the turtle and his queen, But in them it were a wonder, so between them love did shine, that the turtle saw his right flaming in the phoenix's sight. Either was the other's mine. Property was thus appalled that the self was not the same. Single nature's double name, neither two nor one was called. Reason, in itself confounded, saw division grow together. To themselves, yet, either, neither. Simple were so well compounded, that it cried, How true a twain seemeth this concordant one! Love hath reason, reason none, if what parts can so remain. Whereupon it made this threen to the phoenix and the dove, co-supreme and stars of love, as chorus to their tragic scene. Threnos Beauty, truth, and rarity, 
grace in all simplicity, here enclosed in cinders lie. Death is now the phoenix's nest, and the turtle's loyal breast to eternity doth rest, leaving no posterity. Twas not their infirmity, it was married chastity. Truth may seem, but cannot be. Beauty brag, but tis not she. Truth and beauty buried be. To this urn let those repair that are either true or fair. For these dead birds sigh a prayer. End of poem. The Poets of the Tomb by Henry Lawson Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles The Poets of the Tomb The world has had enough of bards who wish that they were dead. Tis time the people passed a law to knock em on the head. For it would be lovely if their friends could grant the rest they crave, those bards of tears and vanished hopes, those poets of the grave. They say that life's an awful thing, and full of care and gloom. They talk of peace and restfulness connected with the tomb. They say that man is made of dirt and die, of course he must, but all the same a man is made of pretty solid dust. There is a thing that they forget, so let it here be writ, that some are made of common mud, and some are made of grit. Some try to help the world along, while others fret and fume, and wish that they were slumbering in the silence of the tomb. Twixt mother's arms and coffin gear, a man has work to do, and if he does his very best, he mostly worries through. And while there is a wrong to right, and while the world goes round, an honest man alive is worth a million underground. And yet, as long as she-oaks sigh and wattle blossoms bloom, the world shall hear the drivel of the poets of the tomb. And though the graveyard poets long to vanish from the scene, I notice that they mostly wish their resting place kept green. Now, were I rotting underground, I do not think I'd care if wombats rooted on the mound or if the cows camp there. And should I have some feelings left when I have gone before, I think a ton of solid stone would hurt my feelings more. Such wormy songs of mouldy joys can give me no delight. I'll take my chances with the world. I'd rather live and fight. Though fortune laughs along my track or wears her blackest frown, I'll try to do the world some good before I tumble down. Let's fight for things that ought to be and try to make em boom. We cannot help mankind when we are ashes in the tomb. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Time Real and Imaginary, an Allegory by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Read for LibriVox by Jeannie Whitfield at Traditions in Biloxi, Mississippi On the wide level of a mountain's head I knew not where, but twas some fairy place their pinions ostrich-like for sails outspread two lovely children run an endless race a sister and a brother this far outstripped the other yet ever runs she with reverted face and looks and listens for the boy behind for he alas is blind or rough and smooth with even step he passed and knows not whether he be first or last End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Women of the West by George Essex Evans Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles They left the vine-wreathed cottage and the mansion on the hill, the houses in the busy streets where life is never still, the pleasures of the city and the friends they cherished best, for love they faced the wilderness, the women of the West. The roar and rush and fever of the city died away, and the old-time joys and faces, they were gone for many a day. In their place the lurching coach-wheel or the creaking bullock chains, or the everlasting sameness of the never-ending plains. In the slab-built zinc-roofed homestead of some lately taken run, in the tent beside the bankment of a railway just begun, in the huts on new selections, in the camps of man's unrest, on the frontiers of the nation lived the women of the West. The red sun robs their beauty, and in weariness and pain, the slow years still the nameless grace that never comes again. And there are hours men cannot soothe, and words men cannot say. The nearest woman's face may be a hundred miles away. The wide bush holds the secrets of their longings and desires, when the white stars in reverence light their holy altar fires, and silence, like the touch of God, sinks deep into the breast. Perchance he hears and understands the women of the West. For them no trumpet sounds the call, no poet plies his arts, they only hear the beating of their gallant loving hearts. But they have sung with silent lives the song, all songs above, the holiness of sacrifice, the dignity of love. Well have we held our father's creed, no call has passed us by, we faced and fought the wilderness, we sent our sons to die. And we have hearts to do and dare, and yet, o'er all the rest, the hearts that made the nation were the women of the West. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Yellow Violet by William Cullen Bryant Read for LibriVox.org by Andrea Coffey The Yellow Violet When beechen buds begin to swell And woods the bluebird's warble know The yellow violet's modest bell Peeps from the last year's leaves below Ere russet fields their green resume Sweet flower I love in forest bare To meet thee when thy faint perfume alone is in the virgin air of all her train the hands of spring first plant thee in the watery mould and i have seen thee blossoming beside the snow-bank's edges cold the apparent sun who bade thee view pale skies and chilling moisture sip has bade thee in his own bright hue and streaked with jet thy glowing lip yet slight thy form and low thy seat, and earthward bent thy gentle eye, unapt the passing view to meet, when loftier flowers are flaunting nigh. Oft in the sunless April day thy early smile has stayed my walk, but midst the gorgeous blooms of May I pass thee on thy humble stalk. So they who climb to wealth forget, the friends in darker fortunes tried, I copied them, but I regret that I should ape the ways of pride. And when again the genial hour awakes the painted tribes of light, I'll not o'erlook the modest flower that made the woods of April bright. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.